my name is Sean Garrity. I'm 28 years old and I'm a teacher. I taught in the public school system for a number of years. I started in Harlem, which is when I got my first master's degree. From there, I, I taught in Chicago for two years. Even taught in Spain for a year. I love teaching. And my experience has taught me a lot, but it's also taught me that things need to change in the, in the public education system. I feel like I, I know we can do better. Taking the train every day is a small journey, um, but I like to think I'm on a much larger one. I've foregone my teaching career for the time being, and I'm currently attending Harvard University to study at the School of Education Policy and Management. The reason why I'm here, um, the Grad School of Education has a, a sort of talking point that it's the nexus of practice, policy, and research. Um, those three themes sort of converging. And um, since I've been here, I've realized it's, it's more than just a, a talking point. Um, I'm taking classes that specifically focus on practice, specifically focus on policy, specifically focus on research. Um, I guess the, the one that I'm most compelled by right now is uh, the sort of theoretical underpinnings of education policy in this country. And, you know, on one hand, how much it's evolved in the past 40 years, and on the other hand, how much it hasn't. And um, it really helps to give me a sort of uh, foundation for some of the things that I saw uh, in, the, in the five years that I was, excuse me, the six years that I was in the classroom. Here's what I want you to do, two explicit school high equals eight. You have those boards in front of you. I want you to just tell me all I want you to do is tell me the method that you use to graph that equation, right? So write it down. First, talk about it. Decide on a method that you guys wanted to bring on in pairs. And then tell me the method that you use, and we can use the method that sort of people feel the best about. So you got about 30 seconds. Talk. Which method did you use to graph number two? So I think being a teacher for five years, I was obsessed with sort of the summary statistics of, of the students that I was working with in terms of, you know, what were their test scores coming into my classroom and what were their test scores leaving my classroom and just trying to have that be as big an increase as possible. Um, but what I've learned here is that more than anything is that these issues that have become increasingly quantified, be it test scores, demographics, uh, percentage of students who are low income, are best expressed through things that aren't quantifiable. You know, and I think that what this place has taught me is that we need any intervention that doesn't address poverty in a systematic way is ultimately going to be undone. You know, in the past 45 years of ed reform, including No Child Left Behind, um, has only just reinforced that point time and time and time again. Um, just, it, it's given me a perspective on how education policy ties into so many different areas of public policy. And, uh, you know, we just keep, you know, we keep doing wrong. By, by the people that need us most. I taught at a summer school in Chicago, and uh, it was an Algebra One course designed for freshmen who had failed uh, Algebra One over the course of the school year, and it was. Uh, sort of two semester module within the summer. And I was looking over my class roster, it was only 14 or 15 kids. And uh, I see one kid whose date of birth is you know, a few years before uh, the rest of the students. He was, I think he was 19 years old at the time of the course. Um, and for a 19 year old to be taken out one meant that uh, he hadn't really, he wasn't really on track obviously to graduate anytime soon from high school. So I took a particular interest in this kid. Um, 
And, you know, over the course of a couple of days, I, I sort of realized that the way that I was delivering the content was not uh, really sinking in. Um, so we had a couple conversations about you know, his previous academic history. And I asked him, I, was, I said, you know, how long have you been going to school at, at this particular place? And uh, he said, four years. And I was like, you know, well, how many credits have you earned? He's like, well, you know, if I finish this course, that will put me in place to be, you know, second semester of my freshman year. So after four years, he had accumulated credits for one half of, of one year. I was, you know, sort of incredibly surprised by this. Um, so I, I went and looked at his, I went and looked at his transcript, and sure enough, of the 21 classes that he had taken, he had failed 18 of them. Typically, when this happens, this isn't, you know, remarkably uh, atypical. But typically, when this happens, it's it's, it's because of attendance. So I checked his attendance, 96 percent, which is 8 percent above the school average. So I'm, I'm thinking, oh, this is interesting. The kid's here 96 percent of the time, but is failing 18 out of 21 courses. So I go and check with the guidance counselor. I show, I, I ask him, you know, about this about this kid's transcript. He's like, oh, I, you know, I guess he just kind of passed this by. I say, oh, that's interesting. Um, wow, okay, you're the guidance guy, I mean, you know, I understand you've got like probably 1,200 students you're worried about. I go and check with the assistant principal. Oh, no, yeah, I, I, I have no idea who this kid is. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what it's about. I go and check with his, uh, with his special, special education coordinator. Oh, no, he's not on my list. He doesn't have any, he doesn't need any services. I go and check with the principal. Oh, no, no, never heard of him. Sorry, man, never heard of him. I'm thinking to myself, these people are within the school. This kid, this, this kid is within these, this building and he somehow managed to be here for four years without any sort of checks on, 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 on what's happening to him. And the reason to me was very clear. In class, he was very quiet. You know, he wasn't disruptive behaviorally. Um, he, didn't, he didn't show the sort of signs that teachers sort of do a quick diagnostic to, to assess whether he has a learning disability. He was able to have a, a sort of cogent, coherent conversation with adults. And I just, I thought to myself, this is like the shining example of a kid falling between the cracks. He's 19, he's not in any way ready uh, to graduate from high school. At best, he's got three or four more years of work left. What are his incentives to stay? He's not gonna stay, I'll, 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 I'll say that. There's just no chance he's gonna stay. And then where's he gonna go? What's gonna happen to this particular kid who was, whose biggest sin? quite frankly, it's being quiet. It's, you know, on one hand it's sad, but on the other hand it's, you know, there's this room right now for optimism, there's room for a lot of optimism, there's room for a lot of hope, I think, not just, not just like in a sort of abstract hope of change, whatever. There's room for a lot of practical things that we can go in and do um, that, that would lead to a lot, that would lead to much better outcomes. Uh, for students from predominantly low-income backgrounds.